This circuit bent glitch effect is one of the most coveted effects in all of art and design. One of the reasons for that being the process has never been easy or cheap or accessible to do until now. But the other massive reason is that it just looks sick as f Today you're gonna learn how to make this effect in Photoshop. And all of these examples were made using the technique that I'm about to show you. But before I do that, I do wanna give credit to the brilliant pioneers of this aesthetic. There are many, but big props to people like Tachyons Plus and Big Popper, who engineered some of the early video synthesizer equipment that even made this effect possible. And a big shout to Polygon1993, who really popularized glitch art, and in specific, this modulated aesthetic. And last but not least, we have to thank the undeniable forefather of video art, Nam Jun Paik. Go check out all of those people if you're at all interested in this glitch aesthetic. What's going on y'all? I'm Duran with DuranSupply.com here to help you design smarter, not harder. Now I know you want to get to learning this effect, but I want to mention something that I thought was really cool. So this modulated look was engineered around the 1970s, but there's really two versions of it. You probably know this effect best from those CRT TVs and the circuit bending glitch effects that you can make from it. So technically this has been around ever since the cathode ray tube television came out, which was around the 1950s, but this effect wasn't really crafted on purpose. The really cool thing about those TVs is that they display images by essentially creating literal lines of light and then using magnets or electromagnetism, modulating those lines of light based on the intensities of the image that is trying to reproduce. So naturally it follows when you start fucking with those magnets, you can get some pretty interesting line effects. So messing around with the technological infrastructure of those TVs, doing things like using magnets or circuit bending is where that glitchy modulated line effect can arise from. But there's another version of this effect that really has nothing to do with CRT TVs, but rather modern image processing, specifically dithering. You're probably already aware of diffusion dithering as it's available in Photoshop, but the really early simplified version of that diffusion dithering looks more like this. And here that modulated effect arises again. And without giving you the really long boring explanation of how dithering works, it's basically distributing black and white pixels to create the illusion of tonal valleys or everything in between black and white. So while modern dithering and the dithering that you're used to seeing does its calculations to account for both the X and the Y axis, the simplest version of diffusion dithering accounts for only one axis. So essentially it's going row by row and displacing those black and white pixels according to the brightness values of the image being dithered. And so visually what ends up happening is you get these lines that start following the contours or the brightness values of the image that's being dithered. And so that's where those modulated lines arise again. And I just think it is really cool that the unintended quirks and artifacts and limits of certain media eventually transform and manifest into aesthetics of themselves. For example, print and scan effects like halftones and the paper texture, they weren't exactly stylistically intentional, but they eventually became to be. Just like this modulated effect wasn't stylistically intentional, but rather a limit or artifact in a method of construction or you know a mathematical algorithm. But eventually that became an aesthetic of itself. But that is enough yapping for me. Now let's check out how to make this effect in Photoshop. In a 300 DPI document, drag in your image of choice. I'm gonna use this photo of my number one artist on Spotify and the GOAT, Jeff Buckley. Go listen to his album, Grace, right now. Anyway, we're gonna be using the Dither Tone Pro plugin, which if you don't know by now, is my high performance dithering plugin for Photoshop. It's got a ton of customization built in. It's got over 30 different dithering algorithms, one of those being modulation. So I'll open up Dither Tone Pro from my plugins panel. I got that docked right here on neat in my workspace. And the plugin is pretty plug and play, but before I run it on this image and before you run it on your image, there's a few things you want to make sure of. Number one, either keep or crop your image within the bounds of the canvas. You'll notice how this is cropped to my canvas bounds. And number two, the modulation effect works best when two things are true. Number one, the image is very low contrast. And number two, the image has smooth transitions between the values. So if that's not already true, you wanna do two things, lessen the contrast on your photo and denoise it. Now you will notice that there's already controls for contrast and denoise built into the plugin and we're going to use those. But specifically with modulation, sometimes you need it really, really low contrast or really smooth. So it's good practice to also just do that beforehand so you get double the modulation goodness. As you can see here, my image is pretty high contrast and it's very grainy, so we could do both of those things. So the first thing I'm gonna do is go up to filter, camera raw filter, and we're gonna denoise this using the detail settings within camera raw filters. So just bring the noise reduction all the way up and you can also turn the detail down if you'd like. And this really smooths out the image. If you want, you can make your layer a smart object before doing all this, but I hate smart objects, so I don't care. Next up, I wanna take some contrast away from this image. So we could do that in a couple of different ways. Uh, the most obvious one is going up to image, adjustments, and then to brightness and contrast, and turning the contrast 
contrast all the way down, which works well. We can also check on use legacy. And this way, when we turn the contrast down, it's really affecting those darker values as well. This specifically looks good when using it with modulation. So if you're using this method, I recommend you check on use legacy when you turn the contrast down. But before I do that, I want to go over the other method, which I use very often, which is shadows and highlights. And you might know about that already if you watch this channel often. So you go up to image adjustments and then all the way down here, it's kind of hidden. We got shadows and highlights, and this will let us sort of lighten up the shadows and darken up the highlights, uh, which essentially is lowering the contrast. So you didn't really have to show all these options. We could just work with the shadows and highlights percentage. So for this specific image, I think I just want to turn these shadows up a bit to make that a bit lower contrast. And the highlights, I don't really need to play with that much. But depending on your image, this is definitely something you want to play with. And you'll get more of a feel for it as you start to actually use this with modulation, which we're about to do in a second. So I'll press OK on that. And then I also want to decrease the contrast and get sort of uh, these black parts lifted by going up to image and then adjustments, brightness and contrast, checking on use legacy, and then bringing the contrast down quite a bit. Now our image is fully prepped. I've got dither tone open here. Let's just click on render. By default, we're actually getting that diffusion dither that I mentioned earlier. We can go up to this algorithm and just change this to medium modulation. And immediately that looks awesome. You'll notice in the algorithms that there's medium modulation, row modulation, heavy modulation, and it's one of these other modulation options. And in this video, we're just gonna focus on row modulation, medium modulation, and heavy modulation, which are all pretty much the same exact thing. The only difference is the thickness or weight of the line. So row modulation is gonna have these thinner lines, medium modulation, gets them a little bit thicker and then heavy modulation obviously gets them the thickest and it's important to note that when you're messing with these different modulation options for example when you're using a heavy modulation this is all dependent on the dpi and the brightness as well so the heavy modulation appears brighter than say the row modulation simply because the lines are thicker so when you're using something like heavy modulation you might want to compensate for that by turning the brightness down or you can also turn the dpi up the higher you turn up this dpi the thinner the lines are going to get relatively i'll get back to this in a second so i'm going to turn the DPI down to what we had before at 72. I'll change this back to medium modulation. And I do want to give you a few tips here. So we have all of these effect controls at our disposal that are going to be very important. I'm going to reset all of these really quickly. So to start, the more contrast and sharpening you have on your image, the more bunched up the modulation is going to be. So if I turn the sharpness and the contrast up, we see in those areas where the contrast is high and the highlights are really prominent or the shadows are really prominent, the modulation really bunches up and it honestly starts becoming just one big blob, which looks fine, but I personally like the more spread out look. So to achieve that, you wanna have the contrast low and the sharpness also very low. Typically, I turn the contrast pretty much all the way down. You also wanna mess with the brightness. As I mentioned, I think turning it down a bit really helps with spreading out those lines and getting that really nice modulated look, but this just depends a lot on the image that you're using. And of course, like I mentioned, it depends also on the DPI and the line thickness you chose in the modulation algorithms. Very quickly, you might be wondering why I have these options for different line thicknesses if changing the DPI pretty much does that for us. Well, the reason being, say I wanted very thick lines, I would have to turn the DPI down, right? But when I turn the DPI down, the resolution of the image is very low. So these lines get very pixelated and just not smooth at all. So if you wanted these lines to be thicker and smooth, you would have to choose something like heavy modulation and turn the DPI up. And that way the DPI or the resolution of this document is pretty high. So we can display these lines smoothly without that pixelated look and you're still getting those lines to be thicker. So that's a relationship that you wanna play with between the brightness and the DPI and the line thickness within the algorithms. Now, like I said, modulation works best with a smooth image and that is why we have this denoise function in here, which is to smooth out your image. You'll notice that the higher we turn up the denoise, the smoother and prettier these lines get. If we turn it up really high, these lines get really smooth and really bendy and pretty and it's a very cool effect, but obviously we're losing a lot of detail. So you wanna find a good sweet spot where you're, you're getting those prettier curvy lines but you're also not losing too much detail and i find that's in the pretty low range between one and five but dino is, is an extremely important control to play with for this look so let's just dial in these settings really quick i'll have the denoise up at four the sharpen like i said we don't need much of but if you find that you're losing those really minute details in the image you might want to turn the sharpen up just make sure the radius is pretty low and that way the radius of the sharpen is only affecting the more minute textural details of the image i'll display that really quickly by turning the sharpness all the way up now we're getting some more detail in the finer parts of the image. If I were to turn the radius up, we're getting more detail 
in the overarching tones of the image. So if you're going to use sharpen with this effect, I'd recommend just keeping the radius pretty low. Now this looks amazing to me, so we can render this. But before I click on save, I want to make sure that none of these buttons are checked on and that for the resampling, I have chosen preserve details, which is just going to help smooth out the lines. So I'll click save here and now boom, look at this. Here's a quick before and after. I will say that when I displayed this before, you probably noticed that it had some more lines going on in the background. And that's just because I thought that looked really cool. But I did that just by cranking the contrast down even more. And by doing that, it lifted the blacks or the background of this image. And so these lines started generating across those parts. So this is actually what I had dithered is this super low contrast image compared to what I just showed you. So I had just turned the contrast way, way down to get this background to look more grayish. And that way, all of these lines would show up in the background and sort of mesh into the face, which I thought was a cool look. So if you want to try that out, feel free. Just turn the contrast, you know, way, way down. I can just do that really, really quickly. Once I click render on this, we can see we're pretty much getting that same cool effect with the lines in the background. So we've got this render. It's already looking beautiful, but let's add some glow effects, which never gets old. Nothing like some good old glow. If you have my glow plugin, you can use that to do this very quickly, but I don't want to overload you with different plugins. So I'm going to do it without it for this video. Let's make our render into a smart object. Then we'll add a Gaussian blur of about one pixel. So go up to filter blur, Gaussian blur, set that to one. And then let's add another Gaussian blur. And we're going to set this to around three to five pixels. Let's go with about four and a half here. Now we'll double click on the settings of the second Gaussian blur to bring up the blending options for that filter. And we'll change the blending mode of that to screen. Press okay on that. Then let's duplicate that second blur. So we'll hold down alt on our keyboard, drag it all the way on top. Now on this duplicate, let's double click on that Gaussian blur and change the blur radius to something like 10 to 15 pixels. And you can already see that glow effect starting to take place here. And now we're going to repeat this step a few more times, increasing the blur value exponentially. So we'll duplicate that again, drag it on top, double click that and increase this blur value to something like 80 or just something in the higher range. Press OK on that and then duplicate it one more time and we'll set that blur value extremely high to something like, I don't know, 500. That is a pretty heavy effect. So we can also go into the letting modes of these blurs and change the opacity to be down. For example, on this last one, I think I want the opacity to be around 50%. And so that's a pretty tasteful glow we got going on. Now, optionally on top of here, we can tack on an emboss filter. So go to filter, stylize, emboss. We want to set the height pretty low and the amount pretty high. I'm going to press OK on this. You can copy these settings if you like. Then open up the blending options of that emboss filter and set that to either soft light or overlay. I'm going to go with soft light here. And I'm also going to turn the opacity down a bit. I just think that's a cool effect. So we'll press OK on that. Now we're really getting somewhere. So now let's go ahead and add a hue and saturation adjustment layer. We'll check on the colorize option. And now you can pretty much change this to whatever color you want. I think it looks best in a blue or an amber. I'm going to go with a bluish tone here. You can also play with the saturation to get more of a saturated effect. I also recommend turning the lightness down a bit to get more of that blue peeping into the highlights. Then on top of this human saturation adjustment layer, we're going to tack on an exposure adjustment layer and just crank up the exposure just a little bit. This is going to bring some of that contrast back and just make it look a little bit more glowy. And honestly, we're pretty much there. So these last steps are optional, but they can help you add some extra glitchiness. First, if your original image has color, which mine did not, as I showed you, but you can always use the recolor neural filter in Photoshop. I think that's, yeah, neural filter automatically colors your image. So that's what I used on the image just to bring some color into it. So here's what that image looked like with color. And I'm assuming your image probably does have a color. But if not, you could just use that uh, that color neuro filter within Photoshop. So it accidentally made Jeff blonde, it looks like, but whatever, it doesn't matter. What you want to do is take your original image and sandwich it in between these two adjustment layers. And we'll set the blending mode of that to color. And now it is transferring the color of the original image onto that modulated effect. Something you could do here is command U on your keyboard, you can crank up the saturation or mess around with the hue to get different colors within here. I kind of like it with a hot pink. So I'm going to leave it around here. Then I like to open up the blend if options on this layer by double clicking it. And in the current layer of the blend if section, we're going to drag the black slider to the right. That's going to isolate the highlights of that image. We go hold down alt and click on that to split it and drag these two apart for a cleaner, smoother roll off between the values. So I think that looks pretty cool. And just to get rid of some of these harsh lines and artifacts in this, I'm going to go up to filter blur motion blur and just put a little bit of motion blur on this or set the distance to around I don't know 50 here and now we got rid of some of those harsher lines in the original image then to really top this off what I like to do is throw on one of my broken color textures and I'll link that for you in the description you can really use any glitchy textures
textures that you have, but I find that these consistently work the best. So I'm just gonna drag on one of these textures into this document. I like to set the blend mode to linear light and I turn the opacity down quite a bit. Since this bleeds too much into the darker spots of the artwork, I like to open up the blending options here and drag the black blend if slider for the underlying layer to the right. That's gonna sort of knock it out of those darker parts. Then we'll hold down Alt, click on this and drag these two nodes apart to get a smoother roll off. So right around here, I think looks good. I'll press OK, maybe turn the opacity down some more. I'll do Command U on my keyboard to bring up hue and saturation. I can mess with the colors of this a bit. And so not only does that add these little sort of artifacts of glitchy and broken color, it also adds a sort of nice overarching grain to the entire thing, which really complements it well. And then once I'm done with that, I like to make a merge duplicate of everything by using Command, Option, or Control, Shift and E on my keyboard, which is a tough <laughs> keyboard shortcut, but you got it. And on this duplicate layer, we'll go into the blending option options and check off either one of these channels. I like to check off the blue and press OK. And then using the arrow keys on our keyboard, we can move that layer to the left or right. And that's going to bring us this really cool sort of chromatic aberration effect. And that just adds to the overall glitchiness really nicely. You guys could totally also throw the original render into my free VHS effect template. And that template is free, so you can get that on my site. I'll put that down in the description. This is absolutely stunning. I love it. To finish this off, we could throw an RGB pattern on top of everything. I have one in my patterns folder right here, and we'll just set that to soft light. And that's going to add that little RGB pixel texture. And this pattern is free, by the way. I'll link it in the description. And that is pretty much it. I mean, this, this is gorgeous. It's really faithfully emulating what you get out of messing with some video glitch and synthesizer equipment with a CRT TV. And this is just one of the possibilities of not only this algorithm, which I've used on things like merch design in the past, but it's also one of many things that you could do with the beast that is Dither Tone Pro. I mean, this is just one of the algorithms out of 30. So I'm assuming if you watch this, you probably have Dither Tone Pro, but if not, obviously this plugin is quite the beast. You do want to have this in your toolkit. It is my favorite plugin by far. Just now you saw one example of how powerful it could be. I also have a full demo video on the plugin if you want to check that out. If you do want to get your hands on this plugin, I've included a discount code in the description for you. But other than that, that is a wrap. I really hope you guys enjoyed and learned something from this video. I honestly can't believe how amazing the effect turned out. And I'm really keen to do some more in-depth tutorials about Dither Tone Pro just like this. So if that's something you're interested in, definitely let me know down in the comments. I really thank you all for watching. Definitely hit subscribe if you enjoyed. Don't forget to check out the description if you want a discount code on Dither Tone Pro or on my broken color textures. And if you want to download the free RGB textures along with some of my other freebies, I'll see y'all in the next one. Peace out.